When solving problems involving rotational energy, we want to first determine that energy or work is actually involved, and then choose a system of interest. A sketch can help select this system. Then, once we know that we have a system of interest and work or energy is involved, we need to figure out what types of work or energy are involved and write a conservation of energy statement. If we have no losses due to friction or other non-conservative forces, then we have conservation of mechanical energy and our kinetic energy and potential energy initially are equal to them finally. If we do have non-conservative forces, then we have to calculate them using some form of calculating work or introducing them as a work term here on the left side of this energy balance. We eliminate terms where possible and solve for the thing that we're trying to find, as always checking our solution to see if it makes some sort of physical sense afterwards. Let's do an example. Let's say we have a helicopter and it has four blades. Let's draw a sketch of those blades right there. They're four meters long, they're 50 kilograms each, and we're approximating them as thin rods rotating about the end of an axis perpendicular to their length. The total mass of the helicopter itself is going to be a thousand kilograms. We want to know the rotational kinetic energy in the blades when they rotate at 300 RPM. Let's write that down 300 RPM and note that we generally want to always convert to radians per second. If we can, that conversion is the same one we've been doing 2 pi over 60 to get from RPM to radians per second. Now to calculate the rotational kinetic energy, we'll say our kinetic energy is equal to 1 half I omega squared. For each blade, we know that the moment of inertia is going to be given by some formula. So I can either integrate to find that or I can look it up in a table. I'm going to choose looking it up in a table. And when we look this up, it's a thin rod, but it's about the end point. And that means that the moment of inertia ends up being one third ml squared. Again, where'd that come from? A table, I looked it up. We plug in our values, 50 kilograms for the mass and four meters for the length to get a moment of inertia for one blade. And note that since there are four of these, our total moment of inertia will be four times whatever we got for one blade, leaving us with a total moment of inertia of 1067 kilogram meter squared. So this whole thing right there was just finding what our moment of inertia is. Now that we have that, we have moment of inertia, we have our angular velocity in radians per second, and we can plug them in to that one half I omega squared equation to find our kinetic energy of 5.26 times 10 to the fifth joules. Now we want to calculate our translational kinetic energy of the helicopter when it's flying at 20 meters per second and compare it with this rotational energy. Our translational kinetic energy is one half mv squared, where now the mass is the mass of the helicopter. So we'll plug in our values and get an answer, hopefully. We end up with two times 10 to the fifth joules. Comparing these, we can see that two is less than 5.26. They have the same powers of 10 there. So it's a little under half, it looks like, the kinetic energy. What does that mean? It means that there's actually more kinetic energy in the spinning blades than in the helicopter moving at you. This is one reason to be very careful and wary of any sort of rotating blades or lathes or any fast spinning machinery because they can have a lot of energy in them. Another way of comparing these two things is we can take a ratio and say, what's the ratio of my translational to my rotational? When we plug those in, we get a ratio that will be a little under one half, as we saw. So it's about 38% of the energy that's in the rotational blades is, the, is equal to the energy that we have in translation.